Well, hello. Welcome back to another very special episode of the TRG seminar series. This week, we have a very diverse and interesting panel of speakers. Uh, this is, of course, Sally, as you know, the ECR special. Uh, we run one of these in the past, and getting exposure to early career researchers has been an important part of why we started this webinar in the first place. So we're really happy that we have another great group of very talented researchers who are able to share their research with you today. Now we have a lot of people to squeeze into our one hour today. So I'm just gonna stop talking and then hand the conversation over to Sally to tell us about our first speaker. Thanks so much, Galil. Welcome everybody. I'm Sally Gainsbury. I'm professor in the School of Psychology at the University of Sydney and leader of the technology addiction team at the Brain and Mind Center who are hosting this webinar. So a big thanks to them for a lot of logistics for this one for all our speakers. Uh, we're really pleased for this. It is one of the, the features of this webinar is to showcase emerging leaders. So I'm going to jump straight into it. For everyone, there will be a short presentation of around four minutes and the chance to ask questions. So if you're watching live, jump a question into the chat as soon as you can because we will be flicking quite rapidly through. The first presenter I'm pleased to introduce is Alicia Sinclair, who is an MA graduate student in clinical psychology at the Addiction and Mental Health Lab at Toronto Metropolitan University. So welcome, Alicia. Hi, everyone. Uh, so today I'm going to be discussing cashing out among people who engage in in-play sports betting. And I'd like to thank and acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. Andrew Kim, and the collaborators of my project, my undergraduate advisor, Dr. Luke Clark from UBC, Dr. Michael Wall from Carleton University, then Dr. Matt Q and Sophie Coelho from York University. So sports betting regulations have recently undergone changes in Ontario, providing an important opportunity to study and speak about the impact of this on the changing landscape of sports betting more broadly. In contrast to traditional sports betting, in-play betting involves wagering on events that occur during a match while the match is ongoing and is also known as micro betting. So for example, whether the final score will be an even or odd number or whether a certain player will perform in a certain way. And a popular feature of in-play betting is cash out features. Cashing out allows bettors to withdraw bets before the sporting event bet upon has finished, meaning bettors can cash out some potential win or avoid a potential loss. It also allows bettors to hedge their bets, making more funds available that can be used to make different bets, effectively creating a sports betting loop. Research indicates that the cash out feature is related to symptoms of problem gambling, potentially because cashing out can decrease payout intervals and can extend a sports betting session. And this may be counterintuitive, as you may believe that cashing out is cashing out a win is a smart thing to do, but there's a paucity on this research, um, and a few studies have suggested that cashing out is associated with a greater risk of problem gambling. And the research I'm going to discuss aimed to better understand the motivations and characteristics of those who use cash out features. The study was conducted using Asking Canadians, an online crowdsourcing panel representative of the general Canadian population. And to be eligible for the study, participants had to be 18 years of age or older, reside in Ontario, Canada, have gambled at least once in the past three months, and have bet on sports at least once within the past three months. The sample consisted of 929 Canadian adults who completed self-reported measures of psychological variables, gambling, and gambling-related harms, and a total of 224 individuals reported using cash out features. In line with previous research, individuals who cashed out had significantly average higher problem gambling severity index scores compared to individuals who did not. And that's that bigger graph at the top. And gambling related harms were measured across six domains assessed by the 18 item short gambling harm screen. We found that individuals who used cash out features were significantly more likely to report experiencing a variety of gambling related harms, including an increased use of tobacco, using worker study resources to gamble, and increased experiences of depression. The primary reasons individuals cashed out was because they wanted their money immediately, wanted to cut their losses, or felt like cashing out was the less risky option. And at the bottom, there's some verbatim responses participants gave, like, I didn't want to lose everything. And we coded verbatim responses into 10 different categories, including relation to cash or money, wins, changing your mind or confidence, cutting losses, ease of use, excitement, risk level, satisfaction, 
starting over to make more bets, and other. And these results corroborate previous findings, suggesting that cashing out is related to greater problem gambling severity and other gambling-related harms. And they also provide preliminary evidence that individuals who cashed out have distinct psychological characteristics compared to individuals who did not. And it might seem counterintuitive that people who cash out experience more harms because some would suggest this is a less risky option, but we found that people are cashing out to place more bets, engaging in a kind of gambling loop. So to address the harms of in-play betting and cashing out, um, we think that's necessary given the increasing liberalization and availability of sports betting in Canada and the United States, and problem gambling and intervention efforts in Canada might need to be tailored for cashing out and in-play betting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alicia. That was uh, masterfully done in a great, uh, great time. I, I want to ask about next steps because I think that's a really interesting study. There was initially a lot of research on online gambling on live action betting, given that that was associated as sort of predictive of more impulsive style betting. So I wanted to get your take on that. Is this similarly a design product characteristic that is more impulsive because there's less um, deliberate consideration? Uh, what do you think needs to be, you mentioned some of whether it needs to be regulated or not, but do you think there's some of that impulsivity or a greater risk taking? What are the next steps we think you need to do in order to progress, whether this is something that should be allowed or not? Yeah, definitely. So um, characteristics of cashing out and in-play betting do have a lot of similarities to kind of slot machine gambling, which is known to be an extremely harmful form of gambling. Um, it has similar characteristics like fast speed of play and continuity. Um, and so, yeah, there hasn't been much about regulations, but I think increasing psychoeducation regarding cashing out could be beneficial because it's quite a cognitively complex process that individuals might not fully understand. Um, but potentially specific interventions focusing on um, stopping people from cashing out or only letting people cash out a certain amount, depending on how much they're gambling might be necessary. Terrific. It's a really important area of study, these these features of uh, new products that are developing that we haven't seen previously. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that as a, as a publication as it, as it progresses. Thanks so much, Alicia. So I'm very happy then to welcome our next presenter, who is Jackie Stanmere. Jackie is actually Assistant Director of the Centre for Gambling Studies at Rutgers University School of Social Work. So thank you very much, Jackie. Thank you for having me. Um, so I am the Assistant Director of Centre for Gambling Studies, but also a PhD candidate in the School of Social Work, and I'm doing my dissertation under Dr. Leah Nauer. So my present research focuses on gambling among athletes and coaches, and today I'll focus on findings from this body of work and give some technology lens for consideration. For context, the findings presented today come from an epidemiological sample of about 3,500 adults, about half of whom were current or former athletes using a pretty lib liberal definition of athlete. Why athletes? Uh, for those who may be less familiar with the betting market in the United States, sports betting opportunities have just exploded. Legal sports betting is now operational in 37 states plus Washington, D.C., all of which has happened just in the past five years. So as sports involved individuals, athletes have become quickly a population of interest. Uh, now let's get to the numbers. So in our full sample, about 61% of all respondents reported betting in the past year. 67% of athletes gambled in the past year, which is significantly more than the 55% of non-athletes. And I mentioned the sports-related betting being this window of intrigue for gambling scholars. And you see the global hypothesis is kind of supported here in this left column. Athletes were 3.6 times more likely to bet on sports, more than five times more likely to play daily fantasy sports, and four times more likely to play season-long fantasy sports, all the non-athletes. But So these are maybe the findings even a layperson would have expected, so we're not going to stop here. If you shift your attention to this middle column, you'll see this analysis of both technology-related gambling activities as well as problematic technology behaviors that also were significantly higher among athletes. Athletes are about four times more likely to engage in esports betting and cryptocurrency trading, and two and a half times more likely to trade high-risk stocks. And then looking at behaviors, they also were almost two times more likely to self-report excessive video gameplay and problems controlling pornography use. 
So I feel like the result of doing research is more than anything, finding more questions we need to answer. And it, there seems to be an important one here is what's going on with athletes and gambling and problematic relationships with technology. I will not have the answer to that in the next two minutes, but you know, we'll work on it. Uh, to circle back specifically to gambling, I'm also sharing some findings in this table related to the gambling venue preferences. That's the channel through which people gamble. There's a substantial and significant difference in the proportion of athletes that were gambling online. Altogether, more than 60% of athletes gambled online, meaning that continuous all day, every day access, including 45% who are both gambling online and in land-based venues. Research pretty universally shows that the more ways in which gambling is accessed, the higher the likelihood for problems. So another red flag for this athlete population. Now, lastly, with the context of these last three minutes, uh, these final findings regarding problem gambling may come to you as unsurprising. Using the problem gambling severity index, we found that athletes had a mean PGSI score almost three times that of non-athletes. This is then further illuminated by the proportions of those with at-risk gambling. More than a third of athletes compared with less than a quarter of non-athletes are gambling with some risk, so a PGSI score of one or more, and more than 13% of athletes had PGSI scores of eight or more, which clinically speaking is indicative of gambling disorder. So where does this leave us? Athletes may be getting more attention in contemporary research because of sports betting expansion, and they should. Our studies support that. But there is more to this relationship than just athletes play sports, and so athletes will bet on sports, and their gambling story ends there. This propensity to engage in any gambling, in technology-based gambling, and relatedly in problem technology or interactive mediums also warrants more investigation, and uh, we're here for it. Thanks so much, Jackie. Uh, it's an interesting talk and it made me think of a, a keynote speech I heard one time at a gambling conference and it was by a professional football player. And he was talking about um, how he developed a gambling problem. I think it was playing blackjack predominantly. And he described it as his sort of winning mentality that made him very good at sports also made him want to try to beat this game that just couldn't be beat. Um, I, I know you said you don't know what the underlying relationship was with, with all these different uh, uh, games, but I wonder if you have any hypotheses around the traits that might explain uh, the activity in both the sports, which seems a little bit self-evident, but also some of the other uh, technology associated things like crypto and finance. Yeah, so... It's not even that we don't know, like globally, the body of researchers in this space doesn't seem to really know. There's been like one off, like, oh, they're more competitive. Oh, they're more risk taking. Um, there's definitely some indication that athletes are more likely to gamble on the sport they played. There's some indication that um, athletes who bet on sports are even more likely to have problem gambling than athletes who are not betting on sports. So I think it's really it's not that we've proven this, that athletes have some inherent risk to them, but I think we really need to shift to these mechanisms to better understand what it is. Um, one of my dissertation papers is this latent class analysis that looks at how risk factors cluster among athletes. So as that comes together, um, and we look forward to the finished product, me included, of that, I, I hope that that helps bring to light so why some of these things might be happening within this particular subgroup. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, I'm happy to present, uh, introduce rather, our next presenter, who is Ronnie um, Nikik. Sorry for that pronunciation. I don't think I had that 100% correct. Who is joining us from the University of Gibraltar. Uh, Thank you very much for having me. So uh, my presentation today is on uh, brilliant learning and memory processes in gambling disorder and um, uh, also recognizing the role of technology. So um, uh, the interaction uh, between technology and gambling and cognition is complex and uh, multidimensional. Uh, so for instance, uh, technology has made gambling more accessible uh, through online gambling and also more interactive. 
Uh, technology also can be used by uh, in marketers uh, to exploit the reward learning processes and the community vulnerabilities uh, to enhance ex excessive gambling. Uh, on the other hand, uh, problem gambling has been shown uh, to negatively correlate uh, with various aspects of human cognition, uh, including uh, learning and memory. So uh, recently, uh, we reviewed, uh, we conducted a systematic review of learning and memory processes in behavioral addiction. And today, I'm happy to introduce you to part of it, which is on problem gambling. Uh, so our results on learning processes and problem or disordered gambling show that uh, uh, reward are uh, those learning processes that rely on the integrity of the executive function and of course uh, the prefrontal cortex uh, were decreased in people who have problem gambling, while uh, that which do not rely uh, or that negatively correlate to the executive function, that is habit learning, was increased. Uh, so therefore, uh, this kind of results uh, tells us or try to show us that actually uh, the juncture whereby uh, the reward, uh, reward reversal and associative learning uh, is uh, significantly lower and habit learning is higher at that juncture marks the important turning point uh, in the development of uh, problem gambling. Uh, our results also on uh, memory processes and uh, on problem and disordered gambling show that uh, 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 we review studies uh, and uh, which compared working memory, uh, long-term memory, and prospective memory in individuals with problem and social gambling and healthy controls. So uh, here uh, in our review, we disentangled working memory into verbal, uh, visual, and spatial, and working memory capacity. And uh, the reason why we do so is that we wanted to see which specific aspects of working memory are affected vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, those of uh, other memory processes. So our results uh, show that uh, the complex fund task was decreased in participants or individuals uh, with problem gambling uh, compared to the healthy controls. But Digispan, uh, simpler terms such as uh, Digispan was not uh, significantly different uh, on the other hand, also uh, verbal uh, and visual working memory task was not significantly different between problem gamblers and uh, healthy controls, but long-term and prospective memory processes were also decreased. Uh, therefore, uh, it seems that uh, problem gamblers will perform uh, similarly uh, with healthy controls uh, when performing ne uh, less cognitively demanding tasks, but more cognitively demanding tasks will therefore distinguish between them. So in conclusions, our conclusion is that uh, our problem with disorder gambling are uh, you start learning and memory processes to enhance and maintain uh, the addiction. This is consistent with the uh, suggestions of the recent studies on substance use disorders, indicating the usurpation of learning and memory processes uh, in uh, addiction. Uh, also, uh, the deterioration of learning processes uh, relying on the executive function occur with improvement of the habit learning, and this constitutes a hallmark of addiction. Uh, so we recently, from this entire project, we published some work uh, uh, that is uh, work, uh, working memory performance in disorder gaming and gambling, and we'll be happy to share the results of our larger project in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ronnie. That's a really interesting study. I, I'm wondering if there's any evidence on the, the causal effect. I'm presuming this is a risk factor rather than an, an, an output of gambling. And if so, if there are any suggestions for implications for people or groups who have disordered working memories, I'm thinking dementia, potentially ADHD or other, or even people experiencing um, depression and mood disorders, which has a, a temporal impact on, on memory. What are the implications from these studies? Okay, th thank you very much, uh, Sally, for the question. So uh, actually, as you say, this is not, uh, there was no, this are uh, not causal relationship, but rather correlational uh, studies that we compared. And uh, uh, maybe uh, the implication of this to perhaps uh, the treatment of uh, this kind of disorders and other comorbid disorders, uh, actually one of the studies showed that uh, 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 emotional working memory training improved uh, working memory performance and other executive function in participants who had uh, uh, problem gambling. Uh, and at the same time, of course, like uh, 
if participants with comorbid disorders, and I, uh, for instance, you, you're talking about Parkinson's disease and ADAD, but uh, the complex relationship between these executive functions in or uh, uh, in different uh, comorbid disorders and uh, problem gambling is totally different uh, because some studies have shown that uh, uh, the performance in participants who had uh, ADHD and those who didn't have, they, uh, they were not significantly different. So there are a lot of research that are needed actually into this area, especially with the community disorders. Thank you very much, Ronnie. I'm going to turn over now to your colleague, also from the University of Gibraltar, uh, Dr. Uh, Harshdeep Manja, who's looking at uh, esports betting. Right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Gibraltar, researching on esports players and betters under my supervisors, Professors George Dimitrovic, Andre Jaco, and Mark Griffith. So let's talk about esports. Esports can be defined as competitive video gaming, and some of the more popular esports titles currently are CS2, Valorant, League of Legends, etc. The biggest tournaments these days peak at over four to five million concurrent viewers around the world. And video games are not just seen as recreational hobbies anymore. There are potential, limited yet potential career paths in the field. And naturally, this growth uh, comes with some potential risks to the audience that it targets. And we recently published a brief article titled Safer Esports for Players, Spectators and Betters, where we identified some of the potential challenges to consumers. For example, physical and mental health challenges, support for professional esports development, or gambling-like elements, including esports betting, which is the focus of this presentation and of my PhD for the most part. Most top gambling providers now accept bets on most major professional esports matchups, and in the simplest sense, the people who bet on these matches are known as esports gamblers or esports bettors. And not just this, esports betting can also be done with more than just real money. Credible skins or video game cosmetics can also be used as tokens on some websites instead of cash. That's called skin betting. We recently published a systematic review that's also on your screen where we aim to identify all empirical studies conducted on esports betting, uh, published in English language journals, and it happened to include, managed to include 30 studies in the final review. Of course, the focus of our studies varied and we divided them into five groups depending on what they were trying to achieve. We obviously cannot discuss the whole review, but here are some of the highlights. Seven studies reported positive associations between esports consumption, that is watching or playing esports games, playing video games and esports betting. Frequency of playing video games and consuming esports were found to be significant predictors of esports betting throughout these studies. And six studies reported a positive relationship between esports spectatorship and esports betting, while three of these even found esports viewing as being a statistically significant predictor of esports related online gambling. In a specific study, Macy and Hamari reported that only 7.4% of their esports gamblers were not esports viewers. Everybody else watched esports. And 13 studies examined problem gambling severity of their samples or the harms associated with esports gambling, and eight of which noted that their esports gamblers scored significantly higher than their comparison groups, like sports betters, for example. On average, uh, on indexes like the problem gambling severity index, a couple of these studies also reported their mean scores for the PGSI, which were about close to 9.5 each. And for reference, any score above 8 on the PGSI indicates a gambling problem. One specific study even found a positive association between esports betting and problem gambling, whereas five of these studies reported esports gambling as a major predictor for gambling on other types. So now that we know about the harmful relationships and the potential harms esports gambling might accompany, what do we know about the general and demographic characteristics of these vulnerable groups? Well, thankfully, 18 or 60% of our inclusion did capture some general and demographic characteristics of esports gamblers. And some notable findings were that esports gamblers were more likely to come from non-Caucasian ethnic groups in Western countries and speak a non-English language at home. 14 of these studies also reported a male majority in their esports gambling samples. And uh, one of my favorite studies in the review, actually, by Rossi and colleagues, found that 89% of esports gambling advertisements on Twitter, now X, had pictures of men in them, and also that 28% of engagements, that could be by liking, retweeting, or just interacting with the tweet of these advertisements, came from users under the age of 18, compared to traditional gambling advertisements, where the under 18 engagements are usually about 5%. So as exciting and fun as esports can be, and I myself like to spend some of my evenings playing competitive Counter-Strike, it's still very important to be vigilant of the risks they might pose 
especially to impressionable and younger audiences, given how esports betting sponsorships are everywhere in the industry. And I personally feel we should be looking to find solutions to protect them from being exposed to the world of esports related gambling, at least till they're adults. Thank you. That's great. Uh, thank you for that uh, talk, Harshdeep. Um, I want to ask a question, uh, maybe a clarifying question between esports betting and let's call it analog sports betting. Um, is there anything unique that you see about the nature of the product in esports or the demographics in esports that you would find distinguishes it from that sort of regular sports betting that we're more familiar with? Um, hey, thank you so much for the question, Khalil. Um, yes. So as I mentioned, the, the biggest concern that I usually have when I look at esports betting uh, in general is is the the addition of skin gambling and skin betting. Obviously, skin gambling can be just more than just betting on esports, but the fact that um, a lot of the demographics uh, for uh, esports for skin gambling, especially in all the studies that uh, we could find, was that they tend to be the youngest of the lot. They tend to be the underage consumers because there's a lot of unregulated websites that allow people to just bypass everything, uh, an ID, while you just skin deposit a video game skin and start literally betting on any any professional match. And there are, uh, it's funny because um, one of the biggest organizations in the world called G2 Esports, which is the top 10 in terms of uh, revenue generated, have a, a skin gambling sponsor, um, which does not have ID checks. So, I mean, just looking at these things, knowing the, amount, the, the demographic that plays video games and then, and then watches esports, uh, it tends to be on the younger side compared to traditional sports betting, for example, is a bit concerning. And I was going to make my quote sort of following up on that, my question around, it seems like a lot of this market is unregulated. And we know there's a lot of unregulated or, or grey sites used for, for other wagering as well, but it potentially is greater. I mean, you know, is there any stats on the proportion of the esports market? And maybe it's a, a question you can't answer, but uh, I'm just wondering, I guess, whether the, there is a lot of integrity to the esports betting or if there are other issues going on here for example is a lot of the betting on the main tournaments which are more more um uh, not regulated per se but they're under specific codes versus more amateur you know obviously with sports betting the lower down the tier you get the more issue there is um in terms of the integrity of the sports how is it with esports in general Thank you so much for the question. Sorry. Um, uh, of course, as you said, uh, it might be something that I haven't looked into that deeply, but um, it's it's quite an interesting bit. There's a couple of studies by Brett Barbano on esports consumers, especially regarding integrity and um, other risky behaviors in esports, including match fixing and and um, toxic behavior, etc. And it most of the, it seems to be very normalized in the esports community. Like gambling, it seems to be very normalized. Um, um, match fixing is apparently one of the studies that we read and uh, included in our review. And uh, esports consumers actually being very tolerant to uh, uh, match fixing, for example, which is a very important part of integrity, right? Um, they they felt a lot of. The, the people who were interviewed and uh, they just felt like it was uh, it, it's not that bad big of a deal compared to traditional sports unless it affects gambling unless it affects bet that was most of the reasoning from what I could find interesting well stay tuned we've got a whole episode of that next week on esports so I'm gonna thank you very much um Hush I'm gonna hand over now okay. to Raymond Wu who is a PhD student at the Center for Gambling Research at the University of British Columbia yeah, thanks for having me. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Raymond, a PhD student in cognitive science at the University of British Columbia. And I'm really excited to talk to you today about some of our work that looks at gambling on streaming platforms. So with the advancement of digital technology, gamblers have more and more ways to consume different gambling content. And one of these is by passively watching other people gamble on streaming platforms. Watching these gambling streams, it's it's distinct from other emerging gambling like activities because the viewers, they're not, they're they're obviously not playing anything themselves, and they also can't win any direct prizes. But these gambling streams have become popular. So they must offer some kind of gratification for the viewers. What we wanted to see here is 
whether people's motives for watching are the same as their motives for gambling. And so we recruited uh, 544 participants from Prolific, and they completed validated questionnaires assessing their motivations. I'm going to start by talking about the figure on the left. So on the x-axis of these scatter plots, we have motives to gamble. And on the y-axis, we have the, the corresponding motives to watch gambling streams. And as we can see, enhancement motives to gamble were associated with enhancement motives to watch gambling streams. Coping motives to gamble were associated with coping motives to watch gambling streams. And uh, social motives to gamble were associated with social motives to watch gambling streams. So something that's not shown here uh, is that for the motives that actually didn't correspond with each other, the average standardized coefficient uh, was only about 0.05. So for those, those generally, generally weren't associated with each other. And so what this suggests is that people derive the same gratification from watching gambling streams as they do when gambling. And so now I'm going to talk about the figure on the right side. Uh, we know that people who have more gambling problems tend to gamble to cope. So we, we wondered if they also tended to watch these gambling streams to cope. For the figure on the right, on the x-axis, we have the standardized coefficient predicting problem gambling, and the predictors are on the y-axis. So self-reported frequency of engaging in all these different activities, and also their different motivation scores. The, the, the two important ones, at least on this one slide, uh, are highlighted, so the coping motives. And what we see is that both coping motives to gamble and coping motives to watch gambling streams are associated with uh, problem gambling. And so what this suggests is that people with more severe gambling problems, they may not only uh, gamble to cope, but they may also seek out gambling streams, uh, despite it being this passive form of consumption to cope with their negative emotions. So uh, to summarize, gambling streams are this uh, new way for gamblers to consume gambling content. And what we find here is that gamblers derive the same gratification from watching other people gamble online as they do when they gamble. And gamblers with more severe gambling problems not only gamble to cope with their negative emotions, but they also watch gambling streams to do so. So at least for gamblers who watch gambling streams, watching seems to be very much uh, intertwined with actual gambling. That was a really interesting talk, Raymond. Um, so it made me think of um, Kick, uh, is it Kick.com? Um, which I think is, is widely viewed as part of the marketing strategy for Stake.com in converting people from watching different types of esports or just watching people gamble into uh, their online casino. I'm wondering how you're thinking about future hypotheses that come off this. Are you thinking about it as like an entry drug? Or are you thinking about it as potentially something that could help people um, substitute their gambling behavior with uh, actually just watching it instead and something that wouldn't be necessarily financially harmful? Yeah, so I think that that's a really, really uh, wonderful, wonderful thought. And it's also something that we've been uh, grappling with. So one thing that we we don't show show here is that we find that people who watch a specific gambling form more frequently also tend to report gambling on that specific form more frequently. So it's it's not the case that these two things are independent of each other and that people are, say, substituting it with gambling. It seems to almost like supplement it or almost enhance the experience. So I can't really say whether or not it, it could be used in that kind of kind of a way. Um, but but they do seem to be to be related to each other. Really interesting. Um, Sally, I think we have a little bit more time uh, if you want yeah. to ask a question before we move <laughs> That's on. That's what I was going to ask. And it's similar to a conversation and research we saw on social casino games. And it went both the same conversation went both ways. Are people doing this as an entryway? Should we be concerned about kids? Uh, I think a lot of parents would struggle if they're not interested in gambling to understand. I mean, but kids watch unboxing on, on YouTube. So who am I to comment uh, what, what people's choices are? So, but this idea of if it's a trigger, then it actually perpetuates a cycle. So they have, to, I guess it's also how it's um, 
it's probably not very regulated. And I know a lot of these Twitch and streams, they also promote, and as you said, and as Khalil said, you promote scambling to the extent to which you can kind of watch it without having that trigger to gamble yourself or, or if not a blatant suggestion and promotion and incentives and inducements to gamble, I think would be, would be questionable. So it's a, I, I wonder if it's similar though to exposure therapy in some way, because that's also been trialed as well, like just sitting there and being used to it and having the physiological reactions passed. Is that something that's been considered? Yeah. So uh, yes, it's, it's, it's not shown here, but one of the things we looked at is whether people actually sort of watch these gambling streams as a way to like satiate their cravings. And what we found is that like the mean score for those reports are actually pretty low. And people actually tend to report that after watching these streams, they actually want to gamble even more. Um, but but this is all within within a sample of of people who already gamble. And I think that point on uh, whether this could be kind of like a entryway is, is really important. We actually recently ran a study where we recruited non gamblers who watch gambling streams. And so uh, that is that is forthcoming. Yeah, really interesting. Great. Watch this space. Thank you so much, Raymond. So now I'm going to hand over to Caleb Lee. Caleb is a, a doctoral candidate uh, um, in the Addictive Disorders and Recovery Studies Program in the Department of Community Family and Addiction Services at Texas Tech University. Thank you so much, Caleb. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm a PhD candidate in doctoral program of Active Disorder and Recovery Studies, working with my advisor, Dr. Devin Mills, who provided awesome advising on this research project. So let me introduce this brand new research regarding financial trading behaviors among gamblers. It is generally perceived that financial trading in assets like stocks and options is distinct from gambling. But what about trading among those who gamble? What does their financial trading look like? So during my counseling session with clients struggling with gambling disorder, I saw that a lot of them actively engage in financial trading. I mean, it was more than actively. It was more of a severe level. They, they seem like gamble in options. They seem like gamble in stock or something. So uh, it happens is especially in the realm of higher risk financial assets. Moreover, we often say, don't put all your eggs in one basket when it comes to investment. Some gambling players follow this advice really well in their financial trading and often show a varied financial trading portfolio. However, previous research has only focused on engagement of one or two types of financial trading behaviors among gamblers. That there's, the, uh, there's a research gap. So therefore we conducted this study to offer a more nuanced perspective on the profiles of gamblers, allowing for an understanding of the configure financial trading patterns across various financial products. Also, we explored descriptive differences among profiles. For the study sample, we collected a gambling sample using Amazon's Mechanical Turk and screened for those who also engaged in financial trading. Within the final sample of 582 individuals, around 36% uh, were problem gamblers based on the problem gambling severity index cutoff score. So in the figure on right side, uh, the graphs, the results identified five distinct profiles, each demonstrating a consistent pattern of engagement across a range of financial trading activities. The interesting part is we can see the distinct difference in the frequency of engagement in option trading uh, in the middle. So um, when we explored the descriptive differences across these groups, these profiles, encompassing demographic, problem gambling related indices and psychological variables, we found that these two groups on the top, the red one and the pink colored one, uh, named high engaging group and moderate stock and high option trading group, they exhibited the highest level of problem gambling severity. 
these two groups are also younger than the other three groups. And moreover, they displayed a higher level of greed, higher propensity of financial risk taking, and higher fear of missing out, and higher level of depression than the other three groups. The implication of this study uh, goes beyond just looking at total trading frequency or engagement in one or two types of financial trading. Uh, the present study result provided more nuanced understanding about overall constellation of trading behaviors among gamblers. Uh, you can find more information on this project when you access this QR code. When you access, please click the gray button in the middle to skip the ad. <laughs> Thank you for the attention. Is there any questions or comments? Yeah, I have a quick question for you, mm -hmm. uh, Caleb. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that talk. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that's, that I find um, very worrisome about what mm -hmm. I would view as an increased view of gamification of financial instruments is that normative views about how much people spend on gambling versus on financial assets is very different. So while you know people might think spending 20 to $100 at a casino is a normative amount of money to spend, people will have their entire net worth within you know, their financial portfolio. How do you think about that financial piece in terms of like, what risk looks like across people who um, use all of these different uh, ways of taking financial risks? Is there, it, it, does that come into your thinking at all that just how much money people might be spending in addition to how much uh, engagement they might have in the, the behaviors themselves? Oh, we only looked at the engagement, the frequency of engagement in the financial trading only. Uh, so that's the that's the same uh, point that I heard from the ICRG conference that uh, the other CEO of the other company they he like pointed out like uh, the the amount of money they spend on financial trading is also really important to look at. So yeah, for the future study, we will try to measure uh, how much they spend on the financial trading and also how much they spend on their gambling behavior. Uh, that's a really good point too, like uh, for the future, future research. Yeah, thank you, Caleb. I think it's really interesting also the social comparison, whereas I think in and particularly in Western cultures, investing is seen as a bit more prestigious, potentially linked with sort of education or a more intelligent or mm -hmm. savvier person compared to gambling is seen uh, much less so as a, given the chance base. But at the, the high frequency that I would look at frequency as opposed to expenditure, uh, given the relative net worth of different individuals and look at the frequency, because I think that's when it starts to look a lot more like gambling when they're not making sound investment decisions, but they're trading very frequently there's a lot less um, rationale for why one versus another thing would happen. So I think that's a, an interesting area to look into things like derivatives and day trading compared to longer term investments. Anyway, I'm going to hand over to uh, Jennifer Park, who has recently submitted her PhD thesis at the University of Auckland. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Sally. Video games are one of the most popular hobbies around the world. I don't know about you, but even my mum loves a bit of Candy Crush. My name is Jennifer Park, and I recently submitted my PhD thesis on online interventions for gaming disorder at the University of Auckland. I've been researching gaming disorder at the university since my bachelor's with Associate Professor Simone Rodder, Daniel King, and Laura Wilkinson Myers. Uh, video gaming and video games are a huge business, and they're serious business too, generating $300 billion worldwide. Even in New Zealand, where we have more sheep than people, the video gaming industry is worth more now than ever before compared to the wool industry. It's worth more than the wool industry, which is very surprising. This has enabled game developers to build very sophisticated experiences that facilitate frequent and long periods of play. Games can bring happiness to many as a form of fun or relaxation, but also harm to some who have gaming disorder. An addictive behavior where gaming is prioritized, with some playing 85 hours a week. Though gaming disorder was officially recognized by the World Health Organization in 2019, there is very limited evidence of how health systems should respond to help those in need. I wanted to help change that. To identify the key components of an optimal health system's response to gaming disorder, 
I started my research in 2019 by interviewing 20 people who had previously sought professional help for their gaming. This study ultimately recommended a stepped care approach, which enables individuals to navigate and access the right type of support according to their needs. This would involve a multimodal system of intervention. So that would include online, self-help and in-person options. Currently though, what's interesting is the treatment for gaming disorder is predominantly in person. We found that help seekers in the study, the majority actually were not experiencing severe or serious problems with their gaming that actually required uh, intensive and in-person treatment. This really highlighted the need to expand the options of support, including lower intensity online interventions. Online interventions compared to in-person treatment can reach a wider cohort of people seeking help, including those with low to moderately severe problems. Also in comparison to in-person treatment, online interventions can also be convenient. It can offer anonymity and also reduce stigma. They're also lower cost for the individual and the health system as well. But are they effective? This year, I published a systematic review that provides some answers to that question. I looked at 12 different studies that tested the uh, effectiveness of online interventions for online addictive behaviors, including gaming. Most commonly, these interventions delivered motivational enhancement and goal setting through websites and email, with one even using virtual reality technology. In terms of effectiveness, Online interventions demonstrated promise when it, when it came to short-term improvements to the frequency, symptoms, and duration of gaming. Not only does gaming have the potential, not only do online interventions have the potential to be a standalone service, but it can also be made readily available for mental health and addiction services to use as blended treatment, where in-person treatment is combined with online treatment. However, there is very limited evidence when it comes to the long-term effect of online interventions due to the lack of randomized controlled trials, with this review only identifying seven. I really look forward to continuing my research in this field and adding to this evidence base, and also seeing how this future kind of looks for this field of work. My goal is not to stop people from gaming, but to make sure that games bring people happiness, not harm. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Excellent presentation. I, I'm going to ask an annoying question, and it's not about how effective it is, but particularly with something like gaming and if someone's spending 85 hours a week, they probably are really enjoying it, at least on some levels. And unlike the knowledge around problem gambling or gambling harms and the debt and that the other things that are very severe consequences, gaming harms can be a little bit more hidden initially, at least. So how do you suggest that uh, treatment providers or others go around encouraging people to engage in treatment, particularly early on, ideally, before problems become severe, when they don't actually acknowledge that they have a problem that needs treatment? Thank you, Sally, for that great question. That's really interesting, given that that is true. A lot of people who actually seek help tend to be lower to moderate severity, but it's also important to encourage people that have low help seeking rates as well. Currently, the reason for low help seeking rates for gaming disorder is because the only treatment that's really provided is in-person treatment. And the whole stigma around in-person treatment, especially for gamers who prefer a more safer environment, is it can be quite stigmatizing and there's all sorts of things like costs and transport barriers to see an expert. So if we provide a more accessible approach, even if it's not an online intervention, maybe phone calls or testing, texting, that would be a great way to increase help seeking, to basically show people that there are a vast range of modalities that they can access. Thank you very much, Jennifer. I'm going to hand over now, last but certainly not least, to Greg Godet, who is studying at the University, uh, sorry, Carlton University with Doc, uh, Professor Michael Wall. Thank you very much, Greg. Thanks for having me. Um, hi, everyone. So the research that I'll be talking about uh, assessed players' awareness and engagement with a responsible gambling program called GameSense. Um, which was promoted to created to promote responsible gambling beliefs and behaviors to players. For example, these could be things like sticking to predetermined 
limit on the amount of money that you want to spend when you're gambling. And this is done via GameSense advisors who work at on-site resource areas called GameSense Information Centers. So to accomplish this goal, we surveyed regular players who visited the three, Mass- the three casinos across Massachusetts, and we found that the majority of players were aware of GameSense. Of course, this is important, um, but what I think is more important is what proportion of players engaged with GameSense, either by visiting an information center or interacting with an advisor. So we found that 16% of players engaged with the program. Um, is this a low proportion? And if it is, how can we get more people to engage with GameSense? So to answer these questions, we looked at who is engaging with the program and who they think that GameSense is for. We found that players who engage with GameSense displayed more symptoms of disordered gambling and also endorsed fewer positive play beliefs and behaviors compared to those who didn't engage with the program. We also asked who they thought GameSense was for, and the majority of players believed that it was designed for problem gamblers, and only a little over half correctly believed that GameSense is for all players. We then asked players about what they perceived to be the purpose of GameSense, and the majority correctly indicated that its purpose is to educate players about responsible gambling and provide supports to those who may develop problems related to their gambling. But this is just one aspect of GameSense, and only a relatively low proportion of respondents knew the other objectives of the program, such as helping players understand how games work in general or helping to dispel gambling-related myths. So it appears that players have the perception that GameSense is for those who have developed a gambling problem, and this might explain why it appears that they're not engaging with the program unless they themselves are experiencing gambling-related issues. These results mimic known problems for responsible gambling programs. So with that in mind, what do these results then tell us about the responsible gambling utility of GameSense? Well, first it tells us that there's still a gap in understanding that these programs are for everyone. And what can we do about this? Well, we need to change how stakeholders frame responsible gambling programming and also decouple disordered gambling from responsible gambling. Most advertisements for responsible gambling programs focus on those who have a gambling disorder, but research has shown that players are more receptive to positive messaging. So it might be beneficial to let them know that the purpose of GameSense is to offer information, support, and resources for everyone, not just those seeking help. And this would normalize using the program and work to dispel the notion that it's only for those with a gambling problem. Underscoring that the program is for everyone, regardless of their specific needs, can help everyone know that they can gain something from the program. Um, That's my talk. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Greg. Uh, So you addressed what was, uh, you know, I think the fundamental challenge that we always had at, at BCLC when I was there, which was trying to frame a responsible gambling program in a way that would bring in uh, a a regular gambler to um, perceive it as something that could just be beneficial to help them, you know, from escalating into higher levels of risk. Um, I I know you mentioned some different ideas about how you might want to approach framing that from a, a general perspective, but I'm just curious about what your take on the program is and whether it's something that could be useful or is it just trying to wrap a little bit of marketing around uh, a boring responsible gambling program that nobody wants to use? How do you think about it, um, you know, having some experience with it as a researcher now? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, We asked players about what they thought about the program and of those who went, a lot of them said that they really liked it and that they got something out of it, Um, especially for those who were seeking maybe to improve their gambling literacy. So I do think that the program can work and does benefit players. I think it's just that for a long time, things have been associated with problem gambling. And so there's a lot of stigma attached to going to it. And so perhaps it's not working as well, or we're seeing this low engagement because of that, you know, coupling with going to a responsible gambling program means that you have a gambling problem. Um But I also think that a lot of past research has shown that maybe only one to 10% of players use these programs and we're seeing 16%. So maybe more players are starting to go. Um, But I think that 
the fact that people are saying that they get something out of it means that it could work if we just change the way that we're maybe talking about it or presenting it to players. Yeah, 60% actually seems fairly high to me based on my own experiences. So that was, um, it was interesting to see that number. Uh, one of the other things that we looked at doing with the programs was not just about exposing people to the program once, but trying to um, have the game sense advisors build relationships with the players that were on site a lot. Um, how do you think about that? Was that part of your research or what do you think about that strategy more generally as, as a way to um, accomplish the goals of the game sense program? Yeah, I think that would be a good strategy of it, not just relying on players to maybe go and speak to advisors. I think I know that advisors do walk the floor throughout, but I think having them maybe approach players and just have conversations with them, not necessarily about um, gambling, but leading into that and building relationships and a rapport with players could help them know that game sense advisors are around and what other things they do other than just maybe providing supports. Um, but getting to know them and just being more exposed could help players understand the broad range of what game sense advisors do. Thank you so much, Gray. And I want to bring back all of our presenters. If you can turn on your cameras, please. Uh, thank you all uh, so much. It's just, it's a really hard effort. I, I was confessing to these guys that last week I myself had to give an essentially my career presentation in four minutes. So it's a hard job to, to speak in four minutes and then have questions thrown at you that you're not sure what they're going to be. So I want to give a, a huge thank you to all of you for firstly, your fantastic research that uh, is so interesting to see. And we've got the privilege of seeing before it's published in many of these cases and for taking on the challenge and putting your hands up uh, from our call across the world to, to who we want to be hearing from. So a, a huge thank you for all of you and for anyone watching please do uh, follow up and contact anyone you're interested in finding out more about uh, so thank you and I'm going to hand over to Khalil yes uh, uh, allow me to thank everybody again and also to point out that on our website you will find links to the bios of everybody that's presented here today so if you're searching for a way to get their contact information you can do it there um, with that in mind, we've got three minutes of bonus time. So um, <laughs> I guess since we can't fairly ask uh, everybody to answer a 20 second question, um, I, I guess we can just maybe wrap it up two minutes earlier than we ever thought we'd be able to, Sally. What do you think? Uh, I definitely encourage you to check them out <laughs> and uh, maybe clearly you can tell them the presenter for next week. Well, I'll have to pull that up. Uh, <laughs> we were so overwhelmed trying to get all the names down this week that um, I'm not sure that I have them all on site right now. Sally, do you have it? I've got it. It is Stephen Hanna who <laughs> is working on esports. So he's working at ESIC and we're going to be looking at exploring esports, particularly on those topics of integrity, um, tech and betting development. So please tune in for that one. Great. Well, that's all for this week uh, and we'll see you all next week.